My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. You must have this book in front of you at all times when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 1126, big with number 10. As you can see, problem number 10 is already on the blackboard. We are given the planets and we are given the acceleration due to gravity on each of these planets here. Question number 11 simply is, what's the weight on Mercury of an object that weighs 90 kilograms? And we are told that the weight is to be found by multiplying mass times the gravity, mass times the gravitational pull. Mass we know is 90. We don't have to worry about the units. Don't worry about the units. The weight is measured in terms of Newton, which is kilogram, and then this is going to be meter per second square. But you, as I said, you don't have to worry about any of the units. Just deal with the numbers. Mass is 90. Gravitational pull for Mercury. Gravitational pull for Mercury, right here. Mercury is 4. So it's 9 times 4. 9 times 4. By 90 times 4, 9 for the 36 is 360. The answer is D. Answer is D. As you can see, answer choice D is 324 because I have rounded these numbers. That's all it is. You don't have to do the exact calculation. You don't have to reach for the calculator because they're not asking for what exactly is the weight. They're simply asking you, can you recognize the right answer? The answer is yes. You can recognize the right answer. It's definitely not 25, 86, or 100. Number 12. Number 12 is a little bit involved. We are told that the weight of an object, the weight of an object on Earth, W subscript E, E is for Earth, the weight of an object on Earth is, we are told, 150 Newton. Question is on on which planet will the same object weigh 170 N? Now, I hope you are able to see right away that there is not really much to do here. You have to understand that if something weighs 150 N on Earth, and that same thing weighs 170 Newton or on, on the other planet, then that other planet, whatever it is, first of all, it has to have a gravitational pull which is higher than Earth's because it weighs more, but not that much higher. The gravitational pull of Earth is 10. It's got to be either these two, Saturn or Uranus. We'll come to that in a second. First, we have to figure out the mass of this object because we need to use it here. The mass is very simple. The weight, I'm going to, I'm going to, Erase this subscript, it's, going to, it's, it's annoying. The weight is simply mass times the gravitational pull. Well, the weight is 150, gravitational pull is 10, the mass has to be 50. Whatever the object is, must weigh 50 kilogram. And we already established that on the other planet, where it weighs 170 Newton, gravitational pull has to be a little bit higher. It has to be this, 11. Anything else is 14 is too high, 26 is too high, 4 is too low. So let's take the 11, 15 times 11, let's multiply it by it, see what we get. 11 times 5 is, 11 times 5 is 55, carry 5, 11 times 1, 11 times 1 is 11, plus 5 is 16. Notice I'm multiplying by 11, not by 1, I'm multiplying by both these together. 11 times 5 is 55, 5, carry 5, 11 times 1 is 11, plus 5 is 16, 165. We need 170, which means of these two planets, it has to be the one that has the gravitational pull of slightly over 11, not slightly under 11. Now we can take a look at it carefully. This is 11.1 .1 and the other one was 10.7. If you were to multiply 15 by 10.7, if you were to multiply 15 by 10.7, it will be even lower than 165. It has to be Saturn. The answer is 7. The answer is B. The answer to this problem is B.
Let's move on, shall we? Number 13. Just because they tell us that we have to use calculator and that, uh, we are, that we are allowed to use calculator, that is not the same as saying you must use calculator. It takes time to use calculator. Don't be silly. Number 12. Well, if we are doing number 12, that must be number 11. Number 12. We are told that... Did I miss something? Nope. We are told that the function has five zeros. What does it mean five zeros? Saying that the function has five zeros means that the value of this function f of x is equal to five, is equal to zero rather, as five zeros is equal to zero at five different occasions. The value of the function is zero at five different occasions. Again, in turn, is the same as saying that this function, whatever it is, must cross the x-axis five different times. So all you have to do is look at these functions that are given to us, four of them, and just count how many times each of these functions cuts the x-axis. And the one that cuts the x-axis on five different times, that's the answer. For example, a, and that's the choice a, I'll do my best to reproduce the graph it is, it is given to us, but the accuracy is not important, just get the gist of it. So it looks something like this. That was not A. I missed something. That is, that's not A. Ah, the, as soon as I drew it, as soon as I drew it, I knew it was not A because for A I have written here that it crosses four times. This is going to cross six times. A, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is not A. This is answer choice six. Answer choice C. I drew C by mistake. So C crosses one, two, three, four. 5, 6. It crosses 6 times. C is not the answer. Let's look at answer choice A. And A is also not the answer. You see that in answer choice A, it crosses 4 times because this loop here does not go above the x-axis. It goes below it. The exact same thing is this. But this time, it stays below it. It stays below it. So we count here, 1, 2, 3, it only crosses 4 times. That's not going to do it. Answer is not A, answer is not C. Let's look at B. In B, we have the exact same situation as here, except the difference is, this guy, this guy does not, we'll see. Yes. This guy, the second loop that you see there, anyway, it crosses four times. One, two, three, four, that's not it. The answer is D. So I'm making too much fuss about something simple. The answer is D. You just have to count, that's what it is. The reason it crosses five times is because this time it just touches it here. It doesn't. It doesn't actually cross. It just touches it at one point. So we have one, two, three, four, and five. There you go. This function has five zeros. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's look at number thirteen. In 13, we are given a function that looks something like this. Height, which is a function of time, and we are told that it looks something like this. 16t squared plus v times t plus k. So we are told that if you throw an object in the air, the height of that object, the height of that object At any given point in time is dictated by this function. The height depends on the velocity with which it was released, the amount of time that has lapsed, and a constant. And the question simply is, 
this, the, actually there is no question here, they shouldn't give us a solve for V. Solve this equation for V. So let's do that. H is equal to negative 16 T squared plus V times T plus K. So we're going to leave we're going to leave this guy here and bring those two on this side. So H, bring the 16t squared to this side, it becomes 16. The negative 16t squared, when you bring it to this side, becomes positive 16t squared. And positive k is going to become negative k. And that equals V times T. Divide the entire equation by T, so that we have the V by itself. And V by itself, H divided by T. And then they put the k along with it is k divided by t, h divided by t, and k divided by t, so it's minus k. And what happens with this term is that we have 16t squared, we have t at the, in, the, in the numerator, so t squared divided by t, t squared divided by t is just going to give us 16t. And it's going to be positive, positive 16t. There you go. We're looking for something that looks like this. And there is answer choice. D, the last one. The last one. That's all. Let's move on. Number 14. Number 14. I dropped my cap. Not my cap, but the cap of the marker, you understand? Number 14. We are told that we are going to make a phone call which is going to cost us 20 cents per minute. And the question is, what is the cost, total cost, cost in dollar, they want it in dollar, of a call that is going to last edge hours? What's the cost in dollar of a call that is going to last H hours if each minute costs us 20, 20 cents? Well, let's see. So we have 20 cents per minute, but since we want it in dollar, we have to write this amount in dollar. 20 cents written in dollar is 0.2 dollars per one minute. Saying per one minute is redundant. It's either every one minute or per minute. Do you understand? So that's what power means. 0 0.2 dollars each minute and we don't want to make a phone call for one minute we want to make it for h hours. So let's find out first how much does it cost to make this phone call for one hour. Well we want hour, dollar per hour is what we're looking for cost of the cost of the phone call every hour. We want hour at the bottom we need to get rid of the minutes. So we know there are 60 minutes in one hour. There we go you see. The minutes drops out and we end up with dollar per hour. Again, we don't want to make one for one hour. We simply want the dollar amount for H hours. So let's multiply it by H hours. The hours are going to drop out and what we'll finally left with is our dollar amount. This is how many dollars we'll have to pay. How many dollars? Well, right here. 0 0.2 times 60 times H. Let me write this in black marker so you can see it easily. 0.2 right here times 60 times H. That's how many dollars we have to pay. Pick the answer choice that agrees with that, and that's answer choice A. I do not know why I see the need to point it out to you to pick an answer choice that agrees with this. Perhaps I was, perhaps because I was afraid that you might end up picking an answer choice that disagrees with it. I'm being bright. Number 15. Sometimes that happens, I want to be bright. In number 15 we have told, we are told, participants, we are told that we are going to run an experiment in which we are going to have 300 participants. These 300 participants are going to be randomly assigned. Do 
reason I write down the word randomly in capital letters is because that is a very important word. If the participant in any experiments, if they are not randomly assigned, then the experiment has no meaning. Do you understand? Randomly assigned, half of them, half, half of them get treatment. Whatever the treatment is, we really don't care. The other half do not. The other half do not. At the end of the experiment, we find out that the half of the people who did get the treatment, their eyesight, their eyesight improved. The question is based on this information, what kind of conclusion that we arrive at? What kind of inference can we draw? What do we infer from it? What do we, what do we deduce from it? And the answer is, what we can say here is that the treatment, the treatment, you can say the treatment is likely to help with the eyesight. Again, the reason why I write down the word in capital letter is to emphasize the fact that this word is very important. Without it, the answer would not have been correct. For example, answer choice C, answer choice C is incorrect because answer choice C says that the treatment will help. That's a very strong statement. We cannot, we cannot assert that it will help anybody who takes the treatment with their eyesight. We cannot con make such a strong statement that it will definitely help. All we can say is that it seems to help. It, it's likely that if you take the treatment, your eyesight will improve. But I cannot tell you that it will improve. The answer is A. Number, number 16. What do we have in 16? In number 16, we are given two graphs. Let me reproduce them here. In number 16, we are told for what value of x does fx plus gx equal 0. And the answer is very straightforward. Whatever that value of x is at that point, the value of the function f and the value of the function g has to be equal to each other but in opposite signs. For example, if the value of the function f happens to be 7, the value of g has to be negative 7. If this is positive 11, this has to be negative 11 and they're going to add up to 0. Let's look at, let's, let's look at the functions. Let me first draw the functions. Let me first draw the functions freehand and then I'll introduce the x and y axis. So the top one is fatter, the bottom one is skinnier, not that it makes any difference at all, and the x and y axis look like something like this. Because I have to reproduce it, it takes time, but you don't have to worry about all of this thing. It doesn't have to be accurate, you understand? Now notice in the in the in the pic, in the book they tell you that this is point one. Uh, this is this is one. In case you missed the x and the y axis, that is one. This is the y axis. That is zero. Then we have negative one somewhere and a negative two right here. This is a negative two. At that point, we find that when x is equal to negative two, f of x, in other words, f of negative two, equals positive two. We also find that the same value at negative 2, g of x, in other words, g of negative 2, is equal to negative 2. You see, at that point, when x is equal to negative 2, when x is equal to negative 2, f of negative 2, f of negative 2 is positive 2, plus g of negative 2, which is a negative 2. A positive 2 plus a negative 2 will give us 0. And when does it happen? It happens when x is equal to negative 2. The reason why it gets a little bit confusing is because there are too many 2's floating around. That's why it is. Some people get it wrong. 
because they don't pay attention. That was number 16. Give me a little break here. Number 17. Number 17. In number 17, we are given a supply function and a demand function. Number 7, we are told how will the quantity supplied, how will the quantity supplied change when price goes up by ten dollars well supply function looks something like supply is a function of price the higher the price the more the producer willing to supply which is which means that it will have a positively sloped uh, line and not that we're dealing with the graph here but demand function on the other hand the higher the price the fewer items that people will buy it will be negatively slope. It will have a negative slope. But this is a supply function. And we are told the supply function is simply half times P plus 40. We are not interested in the 40, which is interested. We just want to find out how many price, how many units, how many more units will be supplied if the price were to go up by $10. It tells us the slope is half, which means every time the price goes up by a dollar, the quantity supplied goes up by half a unit. Obviously, it cannot go by half a unit. What it means is that for for every two dollars increase in the price, the quantity of supply goes up by one unit. Therefore, for increase in ten dollars, the quantity of supply will go up by five dollars. Right here, half times the change in price. Change in price is ten. Change in price is ten dollars. I'm going to put ten delta here. Okay. The quantity of supply goes up by five. That's all it is. Let me again fuss about nothing. It will go up by five units. Quantity supply will go up by five units, and that's answer choice. In 18, I believe we are asked to find the equilibrium price. It at at what price is the quantity supplied equal to quantity demanded? The point, the price, the point at which the price at which the amount of quantity that is supplied by the producer is exactly equal to what the people want to buy, that magic price is called equilibrium price in economics. That's what we have to find here. Well, the supply function has to equal to demand function in that case. Supply function we know is half P plus 40 and that has to equal the demand function which is 220 minus P. There we go. We just have to solve for price. Bring this P here, it will become positive P. Positive 1 P plus a half a P will become 3 half a P. 220 and bring the 40 to this side. 200 minus 40 would have been 160, so it's going to be 180. And therefore price is simply 180 times the reciprocal of this guy. Multiply both sides by 2 thirds. It will just be 180 times 2 thirds. 18 divided by 3 is 6, and 0 has no 3's. 18 has 6, 18 has 6 3's, and 0 has no 3's. In other words, 180 divided by 3 is 60. 60 times 2 is 120. At what price will the quantity supplied be equal to quantity demanded? The answer is at the price of $120. That is your magic price, that is your equilibrium price. Number 18. Number 19, rather. Number 19 is a proportion problem. It is a proportion problem. We are told that one ounce covers one ounce covers seven football fields. 
And if you have no idea what I'm babbling about, which is why you have to have the book in front of you, you have to read the entire thing yourself. What I give you here is just the nub of the problem, the gist of the problem. The nub of the problem, N-U-B, nub, the gist, the essence of the problem. I don't write down the entire problem. Nub is a word that we learn in our vocabulary lessons in, on day number 11. If you want to improve your vocabulary, and if you want to get a decent score in the verbal part, you must work on the vocabulary. Just search for SAT vocabulary words. Just type in SAT vocabulary words, day 11. Watch that video and you will learn the word nub. So I just give you the, the gist of the problem, the nub of the problem. If you, if you want to understand, if you really want to understand what I'm babbling about, you have to read the problem. One ounce covers seven football fields, we are told. We are further told that each, each football field is approximately one and one third acre. The question is, how many acres will 48 ounce cover? As you can see, it's a proportion problem. We are dealing with, we are dealing with ounces and acres. We know that one ounce covers. We know that one ounce covers seven football fields. One ounce covers seven football fields. But we not deal. Then the question is not how many football fields will 48 ounce cover. The question is how many acres will 48 ounce cover. And we know that each acre, we are told each acre, uh, rather each, each football field is approximately one and one third. So we have seven of those. Seven times one and one third. And that has to equal to, that's how, many, that's how many acres will one ounce cover. And we have 48 ounces. So that's it, we just have to solve for x. Let's do that on the top. Just cross multiply x times 1 is just x. So our x is simply going to be 48 times this quantity. 48 times 7. 48 times 7 times 1 and 1 third. I'm going to write 1 and 1 third as 4 third. Because 1 and 1 third is 7 is 4 third. There we go. And now you see the reason why we did that. Let's divide top and bottom by 3. 3 goes away. 4 has 1 3. After we take away 3 from the 4, we have a remainder of 1. What happens to that one? Well, that one goes and joins the 8 and becomes 18. 18 has 6 threes. There we go. 16 times 4 is 64. That I do know. 16 times 4. 16 times 4 is 64. That I do know. So it's just simply 64 times 7. Let's do it out, shall we? 8, 7 fours are 28. 8, carry 2. 6 sevens are 42. Plus 2 is 44. I hope you understand the language. When I say six sevens are forty-two, this is how this is how it says six sevens are forty-two. That's how that's how one speaks. Six sevens are forty-two plus two is forty-four. Four sevens are twenty-eight. Four sevens. Four sevens are twenty-eight. That's what I was saying. Anyway, four forty-eight is the answer, and there is answer choice C. There we go. Now, if you didn't want to go this route, if you didn't want to go this route, if you're unable to see the 16 times 4 is 64, if you're unable to see the right away, another choice would have been this. I'm going to give you a second choice, okay? Tackle it. So we had 48, or rather we had 16, we had reduced 48 to 16. We had 16 times 7 times 4, 7 4 is 28. So instead of doing 64 times 7, we could have done six, 16 times 28. And that would have done the job very nicely. And all we have to figure out is what is 16 times 28. So let's do that, shall we? Let me show you how to do it quickly. 16 times 28, as I told you before many, many times, precision is not required. What is required is clear thinking. So I'm going to show you how, how I'm going to do 16 times 28. 16 times 28. 16 times 10 is 160. 16 times 10 is 160. 16 times 10 is 160. There we go. If we add them up, we get 18, 1, 480. What does 480 represent? 480 represents, see, 1016, 1016, 1016. This represents 13. It represents 30 sixteens. I don't want 30 sixteens. I want 28 sixteens. I have two sixteen, two extra sixteens. Two times sixteen is about 30. I'm looking for 450. 
and that's our Situ IC. We'll stop right here. We'll meet again tomorrow. We'll pick up from the next page, number 20. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would, if you would like to work with me, if you would like me to help you uh, prepare for the exam, I can help you with the math portion, I can help you with the grammar, I can help you with the vocabulary. The grammar is very important in the writing portion and vocabulary is very important in the reading portion, obviously. If you wish to get hold of me, send me an email. Go to my website at kashwaniprep.com and get hold of me. I will talk some more, okay? I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.